Welcome to episode 110 of the Headspace and Timing podcast. On today's episode, we continue the conversation with Dr. Ed Tick. On episode 109, he and I had a conversation about the impact that war and combat has on those who experience it. Today, we have a conversation about what can be done to support those who have experienced it and understanding some of the responses to it. Many human beings have an instinctive revulsion to being exposed to violence. It's not only when we're in danger we run the other way, uh, when it's an actual physical danger, but when people feel in any way danger, threat coming at them in some form of violence, they do seem to turn the other way. That means sitting next to a veteran and listening to his story. I may hear things that are really uncomfortable with. I may hear things I don't know how to respond to. I may hear things I disagree with that make me angry. I may hear things that uh, morally offend me. I may have to look at my own moral injury at being a, a member of the society that does this. There are so many reasons civilians just shut down and the heart closes off and they look the other way. Uh, and this is in contrast, of course, to all the war movies coming out of Hollywood, where war is entertainment. It's not the same as education. Welcome to the Headspace and Timing podcast, a show dedicated to breaking down the stereotypes around veteran mental health. My name is Dwayne France, and I'm a retired Army non-commissioned officer and a combat veteran of both Iraq and Afghanistan. After retiring from the Army, I took on a new mission as a clinical mental health counselor for my fellow service members. If you served in any branch of the military, then you're familiar with the M2 machine gun, the 50 cal. It's one of the most effective weapons in the military's arsenal. If the weapon's headspace and timing wasn't set correctly, however, it was just a useless chunk of metal. Veterans can be rendered inoperable if their headspace and timing's not set correctly either. That's my goal with this show, to change the way that we think and talk about veteran mental health and reduce the stigma against seeking support. Each week, we'll talk with mental health professionals, veterans, and those who support service members, veterans, and their families. We're going to have real and honest conversations about a topic that most just don't like to talk about, veteran mental health. Let's jump into this week's conversation. Uh, my impression was that we had a very deep um, and important discussion of, uh, well, the deeper spiritual and cultural dimensions of trauma and moral injury. And where we left off was saying, okay, we might understand the issues pretty well. What do we do about them? So I wonder if uh, that's where we might want to start. That um, we and uh, many other good people have laid out all of these profound difficulties for, with veteran healing in return. And so perhaps uh, we look at some potential responses and solutions at work. We do a lot of defining of the problem, and, and I think that's what we've done for many years. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so if the problem is not well-defined, now it is a very complex problem, but we have to move beyond um, definition into actually developing solutions, and I think that's what you're talking about. I am, and one of my uh, favorite responses to the clinician world when I when I speak with them or train with them on these issues is get out of your consulting room and into the real world and do something and, uh, and be active with our veterans and in the communities taking action, not just keeping it uh, safe and internalized and hidden in the consultation room. Some therapists love that response and, and, res and go galloping forward and others hate it and feel like, you know, Therapy, it's not only that it's a confidential and safe environment, but honestly, I believe it's safe for the therapist. I no, you're, you're absolutely right. I, um, I had this discussion with my clinic director probably within the first year or so. I, I actually had a mentor who um, very much encouraged me to get out and conduct conferences and, and do speaking and, and obviously where the blog and the podcast has come from. And I asked my clinical director, well, why don't more clinicians do this? You know, we mm -hmm. have 25, 30, you know, clinicians here. 
Um, and she was like, most of them just don't want to, right? They're not comfortable doing it, right? It's, yeah. um, we're, we're comfortable closing the door and having very deep and meaningful conversations, like you said, in the mm -hmm. consultation room. But we as mental health professionals don't, don't communicate to our clients in a general sense. We need better public relations, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if we have a significant mental health field, which we do, with hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of practitioners, we should have developed some wisdom about how humanity can get along well and be healthy along on the journey. So why isn't that making that into uh, more profoundly into public awareness, public education, and our social and political life? Um, no offense to my colleagues, but I think many or most of the people who go into mental health tend to be introverts who feel safe going into those deep individual relationships, and that's wonderful, but unsafe and uncomfortable taking it out into the world. And uh, I think that that's a condition that we have that seems to be both cultural and archetypal, but we really need to, to do something about that. But yeah. Yeah. Um, some of the ethical dimensions of the mental health industry, uh, like um, no multiple relationships, you never see anybody outside of the consulting room, uh, that's uh, breaking boundaries of confidentiality. I think those are made in part to, to protect the, the uh, practitioner and keep the practitioner safe and comfortable. Uh, in tr uh, you, as you know, I study a work with and model traditional cultures quite extensively. You know, so if we were living in a village together, well, the herbalist would be next door on one side and the dream interpreter next door on the other side and your battle buddy in the hut right across the green from you. And so everybody is interacting in a unified village um, with multiple relationships with each other. And they're united as a community. Uh, the, we, we are in such a highly individualistic and competitive culture that uh, we create principles to keep us that way that are not necessarily the best things for our health. No, I, I, I see that uh, very specifically. I've often described it as we know, you and I as mental health professionals and our colleagues know, we know we have a product that works very well. And people should just come to us and, and you know, engage in our product. Um, uh, and, and it's very much a, I will wait until you kind of come here. And, and even me as a uh, professional counselor, um, you know, from my theoretical orientation, it's very much about empowerment of the individual. You come here to see me or you don't come here to see me. I'm not going to force you to, um, uh, to engage in therapy. Um, but yes, this idea of we, we create ourselves separately uh, or we create a, a situation where we are separate from those that we're serving. Um, but then, especially in my experience, kind of lament why we're separated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but stay in the separation to to too great an extent. Uh, I was challenged at near the very beginning of my work with veterans to uh, get out of my safe box. And uh, I was, well, this is going way back. Um, 1980, when PTSD was first um, created as a modern diagnosis, uh, I had only worked with a few veterans at the time. I was asked to present on PTSD to our regional chapter of uh, Vietnam Veterans of America. And I said I wasn't ready. I said I was frightened. I said I wasn't there in Vietnam with you, so the guys won't trust me. I said, I've only worked with a few combat veterans. I don't know enough yet. And uh, bless him, the uh, post president at the time kept saying, I don't care. I don't care. Nobody asked me if I wanted to go to Vietnam. You're drafted and you're coming down to talk to us. And I was scared. I didn't feel worthy. I was pushed way out of my comfort zone. And I felt blessed, really. I felt blessed. I felt chosen. I felt, oh, somehow this man has shown up to help me continue and complete my own initiation and uh, help me develop my worthiness to do this work. 
So I did go down to the post several times. I eventually became a, a consultant to the post and we created emergency response teams and it was wonderful. But that first going over the hump, out of um, the comfort zone of a closed private office and keeping everything confidential and into visible public service as a servant of warriors was a huge step. And now, thank you. You know, the heck with the, you, you know better than I do, the heck with the fear. We have to move forward in our, on our mission. No, you're absolutely right. But I, I also hear um, we, let you, let's even say in the veteran mental health community, find ourselves in a different comfort space where it's all about trauma. Um, it's all about, and, and I, I actually had a, a mentor of mine say, well, of course, that's what we're going to find because that's where all the money is, is in PTSD and TBI research. And so if that's where the funding is to do this research and to develop um, uh, interventions to directly address the PTSD and the TBI, then that's what we're going to do. And so we clinicians have carved out sort of a and of course, everything has to be trauma focused, but not every veteran is struggling with traumatic reaction um, right. from combat. And, and that's some of the things we were talking uh, before about the moral injury piece. But would you see that trauma focus as another comfortable space that we need to move out of? Yes, in in significant ways. One way is that... Um, As Buddha said, life is suffering. Mm -hmm. And we, in, in the trauma field, we are, I think, making, uh, overdoing um, the emphasis on that, uh, on the idea that our suffering is wrong. Life should be fair and should be free of suffering. And there's something wrong with the, each individual if they can't get to that happy, serene, fulfilling life. Um, and that's just not true to, the reality of human experience. Um, another dimension is when we go to where the money is, we may be distorting um, the human truth we learn along the way. Uh, several months ago, not too long ago, maybe five, six months, uh, a VA psychiatrist uh, invited me to a confidential talk. So I'm certainly not going to give away any information about who this person is. But he said, Tick, I've read your books. I agree with everything you said. I agree with the spiritual and cultural dimensions of warriorhood. I agree that we don't necessarily have to treat our warriors as broken people. I agree that our trauma industry is out of control. Uh, and guess what? I'm a VA psychiatrist and I'm one of the operatives. So I'm telling you I agree with you. And I'm also telling you don't ever put me on the spot or report my name because I will deny this conversation ever happened because I've got a good job with the VA. And if I agree with you and start to work in a holistic manner, I'm going to lose my job. The VA only wants me to be a medication dispenser and deal with my 300 veteran caseload and see them for 10 or 15 minutes and just keep the meds flowing. I'm really well paid for that. Your system, your way of thinking asks me to give up this job, find a new way of life, stop supporting my family in this comfortable manner. I'm not going to do it. So... Well, Doc, I think you've got moral injury in the way you're practicing, and I'm sorry, uh, and I'm sorry you feel trapped. And thanks for at least privately confirming the, um, some of the truth of uh, what we're digging into. So I think that's really an example that, yes, you're right. When, when there's money there, people will go to where the money is, and we will interpret – uh, reality that we experience according to the much more constricted standards that have been set up by the professions. <clears throat> We're almost right. not allowed to step out of the box. Um, and, and that is, is some of my experience as well, right? You know, working with a veteran for a year to address existential concerns um, or, you know, what, you know, how do I find purpose and meaning? Um, there's no pill that will give you purpose and meaning. Purpose and meaning and explorations of this do not fit into the medical model of mental health. Um, right. Moral injury does not fit well into the medical model of mental health because there's no pill 
that, that you can take that will resolve the feelings of guilt or shame that you have over betrayal. Um, and, and so there's this, these focuses on evidence-based practices, and I am not anybody who, who is going to go against them. I, I absolutely recognize that prolonged exposure works very well if someone is dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, mm -hmm. and that's post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and I've had conversations where prolonged exposure can also benefit when it comes to moral injury because it is, you know, um, it, it conducting them or, or exposing themselves to those those feelings and thoughts. Um, but but it's much more complex than just PTSD, TBI. Here's a 12 or 15 session protocol. Um, yeah. And then, you know, here's the sane stamp and move on your way. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. We're really talking about such profound personality changes and deep characterological changes that uh, the, our warriors are different human beings now than they were before. It, it, again, in the world history of warriorhood, that's what we want. That's what was meant to happen. Ordinary civilians who have been raised to be civilians are utterly transformed into people who can serve their their people in any culture as warriors that is different than being a civilian and we need to give the a respectful amount of time and energy and support to help our people um, really uh, contemplate and integrate the transformation that they are so that they, they come into uh, to, to you and I as confused uh, perhaps uh, broken people, and they deserve all the time and attention and wisdom necessary so that they can put themselves back together into new, meaningful, integrated shape for who they become. And at its best, post-traumatic stress disorder can be understood as a portal for that transformation rather than as a disability uh, making you a broken person. No, I, I appreciate how you describe that. I actually had a, a conversation with Dr. Larry Decker uh, back on episode 99 um, mm -hmm. and, and talking about how um, combat is a, a veteran's reaction to combat, and especially if it's sort of dysfunctional or post-military life, is an incomplete transformation, right? Where, as you described, um, you know, I was a civilian, I became a warrior, um, and then that transfer that that uh, transformation wasn't completed to make me or to to continue to move me on now now me personally perhaps i feel like i have made more of that transformation um but there's this idea of a disrupted transformation in a warrior is what leads to dif to dysfunction would you agree utterly um uh, i like and support larry decker's work very much he also works from a spiritual base as you know uh, and um, his spiritual base of Sufism is, is fine, wonderful, strong, and um, covers the, uh, the same ground that I'm covering, drawing from other spiritual traditions. Uh, I, I refer to the same idea. I tend to use the – well, we both use the word transformation, as you do, but I also tend to use the word initiation because – Military service, become a warrior, has throughout history for thousands of years been the form of initiation uh, through which we put youths through right, uh, life-challenging, life-threatening rites of passage. And most of them come out on the other side, uh, and then they are initiated into warriorhood. So initiation is an ancient uh, and universal uh, anthropological um, practice uh, it occurs around the world. We fail in our culture to initiate young people well. All most forms of initiation are gone. So the youths try to initiate themselves, and so we get a lot of gang behavior, a lot of street violence, a lot of the, the problems of gangs are youths trying to initiate themselves and each other because the adults have failed, we have failed to give them initiatory practices. The military is one of the very few forms of genuine initiation we have, except that it's incomplete. It takes the civilian out, it deconstructs the civilian identity, it gives it 
warrior training and experience to replace that civilian identity. But then after the military experience is over, you're just released into the public. And so uh, I call it incomplete initiation. The initiatory process has taken us out, given us the descent into the underworld and the skills and the training necessary to survive there, and then said, okay, you're done, you're done, you're on your own, be a civilian again. And that's not a complete initiatory process. Always in initiation, the community and the tribe and its leaders bring the initiate home and complete an education and a homecoming of utmost respect and support such that the the new young initiate can really absorb and integrate um, what he's experienced and learned and then use it. And we don't do that second half of initiation. So, Larry, I agree with Larry Decker um, that we've started a transformational pro- process but not completed it. And if we put that in the, in the frame of initiation, that the initiatory process is meant to be a transformation from child psychology to adult psychology through guided ordeal and uh, and carefully orchestrated and ritualized return to the community with recognition by the community, then we only do half the half of it and we don't finish it and we need to. And so I strongly argue that uh, both PTSD and moral injury as we know them today really have significant roots in the uh, neglectful and incomplete homecoming that we give our warriors. As as you're talking about that, and, and so I retired uh, from the Army after 22 years, so I had a retirement ceremony, right? There was actually oh. a an, an, an end point, right? Um, and and this is the and even as you say homecoming and this is um this is a story that that I value and I cherish and I know my father did too. My father um is a I mentioned before is a Vietnam veteran and he was there for my retirement ceremony. Uh and as the colonel was reading through everybody's bio, he's reading through my bio. Uh and then he stopped uh and he said, And by the way, we're also joined here by Sergeant Francis, my Sergeant Francis father specialist France. Um, and he stopped and he looked at my dad in the audience and he said, sir, I just want to say thank you because what you and your um, fellow soldiers went through made it possible for us. And if you haven't heard that before, I wanted you to hear it now. I mean, and it was an amazing, you know, it, it, the colonel didn't have to do that. Um, and then afterwards, um, there was a, a, a group of sergeants, major and colonels and majors lining up to shake my father's hand. Um, just as much as is to shake my hand. Right. And so but but he didn't get a when he left the military, he he um, he got out uh, out of Fort Leonard. But there was no ceremony. There was no, um, you know, like you said, recognition like this. Um, and many service members that don't make it to sort of that end of um, mm-hmm. of of their career. Here's a piece of paper. Good luck. I hope you know where to go now. And, and there is no sort of and, and even that retirement ceremony was a measure of ritualism and, and, and ceremonial sort yes. of endpoint. Um, mm-hmm. But I, the vast majority of service members don't get that. Uh, true and tragic. Uh, our military is a highly ritualistic organization. That's good and necessary, and it moves our service members through, um, well, How should we say this? The developmental process that's in the military from just becoming a a recruit all the way up through as far as you go and as long as you serve. It's ritualized all the way. And, you know, as you go through the ranks, as you uh, change MOS, um, as you, you know that you're changing life status with all the concomitant relationships uh, changes and the roles and responsibilities changing, and there's some ritual along the way to mark it. So you know you, your your psyche knows you've gone through this door. But when we don't give people that, we're le- left on their own. You're a civilian now. Goodbye. Good luck. You're a civilian now. Well, no, I'm not. Right. No, I'm not, and I don't know how, what to do and how to be anything now on the streets. It's terrible. It's horribly, horribly confusing. And um, 
I find, I wonder if this is your experience, that the more people uh, our warriors have had ritual from the military or in communities that are wise enough to give it, the better able they're, the better they are able to carry their military and combat experiences without breakdown. Yeah, I agree. I think from what I've seen with, with veterans that I've worked with, those that have had sort of a um, a longer transition before they leave the military. I, I had a, a Marine Corps veteran who um, has been on the show before, Jay Knight, um, where he says, you know, I was a combat Marine, um, but then for about the last nine months, he was working in like the, the battalion headquarters or something like that. And he's like, the pace was much slower. Yeah, there was some irritating stuff, but it's not like I went from 60 miles an hour to zero. He said, I went from 60 to 40 to zero, right? And and I personally had that same experience too, is as I retired, I was given um, time, you know, by my, my unit to be able to take care of what I needed to and, and almost to get my mind ready. We talk about Prochaska and Clemente stages of change where, where I became ready for the change when the change happened. Um, and, and I see that same thing. Those veterans that were able to get some measure of closure, some measure of, um, in whatever way they had, um, to be able to say, okay, this is ending. This next thing is going to begin and we're going to help transition you to that. And this is this idea of, you know, we talk about the transition. It's not just the transition into a new life, um, into a new job, to a new city. Um, it's a psychological transition. It's an emotional, maybe even a spiritual transition. Uh, because like you said, I'm, I'm not a civilian and I'll never be a civilian. Right. Um, I, I was a soldier. I'm no longer allowed to be a soldier. I'm not a civilian. I'm, I'm this weird third thing that's a mixture of the two of them, which is called a veteran, which makes veterans, you know, sometimes feel like they're out of place and a little uncomfortable because they can't be what they were and they don't know how to be what other people want them to be. Yes. Okay. So uh, helping our veterans find a place in our society after service is really difficult. And simply labeling our vets with the veteran status and expecting them to just carry that on their own and civilians to not even know or recognize it except perhaps on our our, our two military high holidays, um, Veterans Day and Memorial Day, <clears throat> that, that's not enough. It doesn't do it. Uh, I was, I'm reminded of a beautiful story. Um, I was a keynote speaker at a college summit on veterans and veteran care and veterans and higher education. When I arrived, um, the, the convener of the conference was one of the professors there who ran up to greet me before he even said, oh, we hadn't met before, but before he even said hello, he was in his jacket and tie and he pointed to his lapel and he had the CIB, a little CIB, you know, that little pin. Mm -hmm. And he right. He pointed it to it, and he had a terribly worried look on his face, and he said, is it okay if I wear my CIB pin at our conference today? And I just opened my arms, and I said, of course, brother, it's your eagle feather. What do you mean eagle feather? I said, well, in the, our Native American communities, a, better, a warrior would always wear his eagle feather around camp. Just so the people would know that the warriors were in their midst. And he wasn't making a show of it. It was just an honorific identification so that the people know the warriors are nearby if they need them. That's your eagle feather. And nobody else but, somebody, but one who has earned it should be wearing it. And he just smiled and thanked me. And then for his opening remarks... For the first time, he had never worn it before, and he had never told his campus that he was a Vietnam combat vet. But he got up there proudly, and he pointed to his lapel in his opening remarks and said, this is who I am, and you need to know this. And this is the professor you've been working with all this time, and this is why we're having this conference. And from now on, talk to me about it. And I won't, I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to be ashamed. Uh, you, you need to know, and we need to have relations between – civilians and older warriors, not just our younger vets we're here to care for today. So, and he's worn it ever since, bless him. Uh, and uh, some people ask, and that's good. 
and he has no more shame attached to it, and that's great. You know, I, I think that's very important, the idea of um, recognizing, and I've often said veterans want people to understand what they went through and often have a hard time, you know, kind of putting words to that or, or they don't really want to open that door because obviously you get maybe some of the inappropriate questions. Um, but this puts me in mind of... of um, uh, Sebastian Younger's book, Tribe. Um, uh, Sebastian is going to be a guest on an upcoming show. But in his book, uh, he writes, humans are so strongly wired to help one another and enjoy such social benefits from doing so that people regularly, list, ri regularly risk their lives for complete strangers. My response to that is, what happens when we no longer receive those social benefits? And I'm not saying that, you know, you should, you know, appreciate me for all the things that I, but what happens when there are no longer social benefits and actually social detriments to being someone that risks their lives for others? I agree with Sebastian. His book and his work are important. Uh, he and I have discussed at length the difference between healing and adaptation. Uh between how, how can, well our culture expects people to adapt to their traumatic wounds and maybe carry them with help through medications but we're talking about true healing sebastian and i are concerned that true healing and integration of the warrior experience is not happening that much we're also concerned about this it's very important uh, we both study other cultures and work in other cultures. In that important book, Tribe, Sebastian discusses Israeli society quite extensively and the fact that the Israeli military only um, reports 1% PTSD. So how is this possible in a country that is surrounded in a, in a permanent combat zone and surrounded by hostile powers all the time? Uh, and I report extensively on how and why there is no chronic long-term PTSD, such as we have here in the U.S., in Vietnam, in spite of the war being over there and, and the losses to the Vietnamese people and infrastructure being so extraordinarily extensive. We lost 58,000 people. They lost 3 million. So Sebastian and I are both concerned about this. What is the difference between... Um, communalizing trauma as both Vietnam and Israel do versus individualizing it as we do. We call PTSD and moral injury an individual wound and we have a massive mental health system um, to try to treat it. In Israel and in Vietnam both, and some other cultures do this as well, the wound is communalized, which means everybody recognizes it and everybody carries it together so there are you know what our memorial day we all know is descended for in large part to be the first day of summer vacation and people celebrate it that way and they and it is not a deeply serious somber national holiday it should be in both the countries we're talking about israel and vietnam they have several memorial days for different wars they have uh, uh, somber holidays for those killed. They have separate holidays for the MIAs. Um, they attach those holidays to other important national events. And the country, re both countries really do shut down. They don't use these uh, holidays as excuses for sales in the malls or for any, any other matter than this is a military holiday that we all need to honor for all of our people. And these practices, communalization of trauma, rather than individualization, as we do, and pathologization, rendering the traumatic impact a wound, a disability, a mental health weakness. That's what we do, and we're, it's so wrong. And the other country saying, we're all this concerns us all, and in some way we are all wounded by the wars we've had to fight, and we can carry those wounds together and give 
national uh, support and attention to it without allowing anything else to go on. Uh, those co- those countries and those people heal better. It happens in Australia and New Zealand as well. They have the national holiday called Anzac Day, which is their equivalent of Veterans Day. And really, truly, everything shuts down. Stores are not allowed to be open. Everybody comes out to honor the veterans. And they also make a distinction between combat and non-combat veterans, realizing the combatants need more support. So my colleagues down under say... um, the only people we call veterans are the ones who have been in combat. So I asked, well, what do you call the rest of you who served? And my, my uh, psycholo- military psychologist friend down under just laughed and said, oh, most of us are only blokes who served. The only, <laughs> the only real veterans are the combatants who have really been through the hell for the rest of us. So there, too, there's communalization and there's profound social support, awareness of the cost of serving, and recognition by everybody nationally uh, to those who serve. So one thing we could do in this country would be simply to restore the original meaning and import of these holidays and others um, that really have to do with uh, war's consequences and healing. Mother's Day, for goodness sake, was originally that. I don't know how many people know it, but I urge all of our listeners before this Mother's Day in May to go back and read the original Mother's Day proclamation. It was a call to all the mothers of the world to unite, to help all of our children who have been through war, and to encourage mothers of the world to stand against war so we don't kill each other's children. What a beautiful original meaning for the holiday. That's not what the Hallmark cards say. Imagine if justice, if the Mother's Day proclamation were maybe read on public radio on that day and houses of worship, churches and synagogues and mosques read the Mother's Day proclamation as part of their Sunday morning service that week. Even that would help change everything, would make Uh, all of us more aware of the need for warrior and and warrior family recognition and support. So these are big things that could be done without too much difficulty, except resisting the corporations and their profit motives. Um, But they could. And enlightened leadership could call this into being. Short of that, we can do that in our own communities. Uh, I, in my, with my organization, Soldier's Heart, we've been leading um, Memorial Day retreats for, for the whole Memorial Day weekend where we do intensive memorial rituals for honoring the fallen, our own fallen, uh, honoring and praying for the lives we've taken, uh, examining what we've done to for, for atonement or retribution, examining the moral injuries we're carrying as a result of our of our losses and their losses and the losses to life. And, you know, four days of beautiful contemplation, prayer, ritual, and ceremony. And uh, people come out, well, feeling profoundly different. Very much healing occurs. And it's always, in my retreats now, uh, I always include civilians and veterans together. The civilians have to be the sacred witnesses They have to know what's going on and what's been done in their names and for their protection, whether they agree with it politically or not. It's actually a a second issue. It's beside the point. The first point is how do we bring our warriors and civilians together into one united nation? Uh, And so we do and we can do this. Um, And so I, I put aside every Memorial Day to give this sacred service. And we can do that. Of course, there are many Memorial Day events going on around the country. I don't know how many of them are enlightened versus how many are patriotic. But we can, in our own communities, uh, influence our local people, civilians, politicians, and call our veterans out of hiding um, to create these kind of unifying and healing events. 
No, I, and I, I absolutely agree with, um, with helping to have the community to understand this idea of uh, the, the community or communal um, bearing of the trauma. Uh, and you mentioned some of the difficulty may, of course, come to the corporations who, who have their bottom line. Uh, but I also don't wonder if it would be a challenge to sort of the um, the overall mindset of I support the troops, but I support them at a dis- distance, right? I mean, I, right. I, I wave a flag. I put a, not that we have the yellow ribbon uh, magnets on our cars anymore, but um, a, a, a colleague of mine once talked about, um, he was on an airplane and he was sitting, you know, sort of in the back of the plane and a young service member, Marine or, or what have you, comes on. Um, and they make the announcement of, you know, let's, uh, you know, clap for our nation's hero and stuff like that. Uh, and the entire plane clapped and, and cheered. Um, and then he was uh, sitting with his seatmate and he said, I'm a veteran, um, you know, and I work for veterans and with veterans. And, and he'd be like, you know, I'd like to answer, you know, some of the questions or, or you know, he just wanted to have a conversation about that whole thing. Uh, and the lady was like, well, but of course I support veterans. Didn't you just hear me clapping? And and she didn't want to have a deeper conversation beyond just the, well, of course I support Memorial Day. I, I you know I take the day off, and that's how I celebrate this idea of um, maybe recognizing without understanding. I think that might be a challenge to this this mm-hmm. idea as well. Well, I agree with that, and it seems that uh, many human beings have an instinctive revulsion to being exposed to violence. And so it's not only when we're in danger, we run the other way, uh, when it's an actual physical danger, um, but when people feel in any way danger, threat coming at them uh, uh, in some form of violence, they do seem to turn the other way. Um, And that means sitting next to a veteran and listening to his story. I may hear things that are really uncomfortable with. I may hear things I don't know how to respond to. I may hear things I disagree with that make me angry. I may hear things that uh, morally offend me. I may have to look at the my own moral injury um, at being a, a member of the society that does this. There are so many reasons civilians just shut down and the heart closes off and they look the other way. Uh, and this is in contrast, of course, to all the war movies coming out of Hollywood, where war is entertainment. It's not the same as education. Some of the war movies educate the, the public. Uh, but here, too, we're talking about how to heal in society and how to heal a society. So you and I both know, as clinicians and warriors, how important storytelling is and that Storytelling is a necessary component of homecoming, and storytelling happens in therapy. It has to happen and should happen in therapy. That is, as we say in science, necessary but not sufficient, because eventually the storytelling has to happen to the entire culture. Uh, And originally, warriors were always, um, always had opportunity to tell their stories to the entire tribe, sometimes symbolically through ritual. Um, Native American war dances, uh, we wrongly imagine, and Hollywood uh, helped create this, that war dances were for warriors to whip themselves up into a frenzy to go out into the battlefield and be as uh, powerful and berserk as possible. Well, in fact, most of the war dances were about homecoming. And they were a form of movement therapy. They were dances in which the warriors could enact their battles, but they turning their war, their battle movements into creative artistic movements like uh, Tai Chi or Qigong. Um, the, the martial arts of the East <clears throat> are beautiful dance movements that when they're really strong and intensified, become warrior, right? Well, the war dances are the reverse. I'm going to take my war movements and turn it into a dance. So at my retreats, uh, for healing retreats, we often stage a war dance. 
and we invite the warriors into the center to turn those old movements that are still in their body into dances and also to tell some of their story through their movement and uh, um, communicate that to our gathering that way. And we, it, it, it's always so moving and emotional for everybody involved. But my point is that storytelling is supposed to occur to the entire community. And that educates and initiates the community so that they know what our warriors endure in their service. And so they're not so innocent and naive and frightened of violence so that they turn away. So what we have in general, overgeneralizing, is that Warriors are people who run into danger in service to the rest of us to protect us. And the civilians run the other way. And uh, we're trying to bring that together a little bit and initiate the civilians as well into what it takes to turn around and run into danger uh, and overcome that instinctive um, <clears throat> fear and revulsion uh, and self-protection. And warriors learn that. You have to learn that to become a warrior. I'm going to move into danger and protect my my battle buddies and my unit and myself and, and see this mission through no matter what. So civilians don't learn that. And warrior-civilian relations can help civilians be more comfortable in facing uh, the dangers of life and appreciating what our warriors do for them. You know, this idea of uh, healing in society, making the healing of the warrior, um, and, and through no fault of the warrior, other than we volunteered for what we're doing, so to speak, um, we were wounded, um, and it doesn't make us weak, it doesn't make us broken, it's just it, we were changed by it. Um, but true healing has to happen within a society, um, not separate yeah. from a society. I think back to... Um, you know, there's much, even uh, again, and I think uh, Jonathan Shea, um, Achilles in Vietnam, and looking back at, at the, mm -hmm. the ancient Greek plays, uh, Philoctetes, um, and, and you know, these were ways to communicate to the community of the Greeks um, of, of, you know, this is what happened. This is, this is a form of education. Um, and, and it goes back to what you say is, now mental health is isolating. We're self-isolating as clinicians, right? We're over here. Come over to here if you need this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is the, the gap between the mental health professionals that are trying to help heal the warriors, um, that we're even isolating ourselves. I often describe it as, um, you know, say as we get out of the military, we have this house and there are different rooms in the house. There's the employment room and, and the housing room. And, and we go through all of these different rooms and get what we need. And if none of those work, there's a shed out and back where you go to mental health, right? It's always this very right. separate structure, right. where, whereas it's, you know, if there was this, this healing, this wellness component um, interlaced through all of them, and it doesn't mean, you know, PTSD, it doesn't mean traumatic brain injury, all those are, those are components of it. Um, but a colleague of mine calls it transition stress, the stress that um, that occurs as we transition out with this incomplete initiation or transformation. Um, I'm hearing from you that healing has to occur within the confines of a community and it can't be separate or it won't be true healing. Correct. We, then we we don't become part of our community again unless unless in the initiatory process, the community sees and honors us as we are, um, as we graduate into a higher social status. We are returned elder warriors. We have come back from hell in your service and for your benefit, and you need to see this and recognize this and honor us for it. And I actually believe that the struggle for veterans' benefits. Uh, is in part this hidden struggle for honor from the culture that has dishonored us. And so in our modern American society, everything is uh, judged by money. And so, well, if we can't get honor, then at least let's get money that represents um, gratitude and support for the service we've given and what it's taken from me. 
uh, but that's really not enough. So uh, there's three different ways I translate our acronym PTSD since we're stuck with it. Uh, and one is post-traumatic soul distress. It's not just broken brain. It's everything we've ever said about the soul, the mind, the heart, the body, the values, the, the moral system. Socrates taught us 500 years before, Je 400 years before Jesus, you know, that this, the, the soul is that in us which uh, distinguishes good from evil, right from wrong. And we're better when we act toward the good and we're worse for it and our souls are harmed when we act toward the evil. Moral tr injury is not a new concept. It's just being psychologized now. Um, so good thing that it, it's coming back, um, but it's built into us. Um, so, okay, so soul distress. Every aspect of our being is changed and transformed. It's not the same as a pathology. It's a transformation. And then it's also post-traumatic social disorder. It's social disorder. <clears throat> we have become alienated from each other. Civilians and warriors have become alienated and don't have much to do with each other. And as you rightly just shared, um, the mental health community has become alienated from the warriors. Come to my territory. I'm not coming to yours. And also from the public. Take care of the sick people and leave us alone. None of those are true. We, it's a social disorder. Whenever a society gives more of its resources to... Uh, to, to practices of, of military and warfare and less of its resources, far less of its resources to taking care of its people, it's in social disorder. We are. Whenever we have this terrible alienation between warriors and civilians, we're in social disorder. And so we really need to respond to that. And I often tell our vets, you're not the problem, brothers and sisters, it's not you. It's the profound social disorder that we're all in and you've been trapped in and victimized by it. And you are being made to carry the entire culture's moral injury and collective shadow. Because the civilians and the pundits aren't looking at these issues and they're collapsing all on you. So we need to get it off you and get the problem back into to social change where it is. So finally, to do all that, I say PTSD has another translation, and that's post-traumatic spiritual development. That's for the individuals and society to broaden our understanding and include, God bless it, to include warriorhood as one of our spiritual concepts and roles and help restore great respect and spirituality and absolute love and total support for the warriors. And again, it's the society that has to grow that and bring it forward. It's not the warrior's responsibility to not only go to be in the service and go to war for you, but also to tell you how to care for us. <laughs> we got to do that work also. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's our job to care for you the correct way. And if we do that and we overcome the veteran civilian divide and civilians do these practices we're talking about, honor, ritual, recognition, support um, in public in every way possible, uh, we can heal this mess and, yeah. take the, and take it off the veteran's shoulders to do all that healing for themselves by themselves. And, and I is definitely that spiritual aspect, as you said, um, you know, native cultures and, and their traditions. Um, I'm thinking in the Bible, uh, in the New Testament, where, um, you know, Jesus for a centurion, I was a soldier, you know, um, no greater faith in all of Israel is the one that, that I see before me or, or what, you know, and mm -hmm. so in, in or, or the Sufism, Sufism with Dr. Decker, this idea yeah. of, you know, um, Warriors are respected, and not to say that you must respect me, Dwayne France, because I'm a warrior, but that which I represent, or 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 this, and and, and again, this isn't creating a warrior caste. This isn't, um, um, you know, the 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 Highland movie, you know, of of you know, you can only be a citizen if you um, actually um, uh, actually serve in the military, um, but to to basically some of this. Um, military civilian divide is the misunderstanding and the deliberate separation of the healing 
and uh and and yeah it's amazing it was it was an amazing to talk to you again today it's just uh, every time uh, that we have a conversation for me it's it's mind blown and uh and i really appreciate you uh continuing a conversation i feel like we're going to have many more in the future <laughs> well good i look forward to that uh, i feel the same way i'm honored to to know you to share this way and well we share a profound mission it's beautiful it's talk about uh, warrior spirituality serving our warriors awakening the public to their true needs and calling the public to awaken whatever innate warrior spirituality is in them so we can join uh, forces and become one people it is uh, sacred and beautiful work and Honored to share it with you and look forward to more conversations. I couldn't think of a better way to end our conversation today. Thank you so much. You're so welcome, Dwayne. Thank you. You're listening to Headspace and Timing, where we're trying to change the way that we think and talk about veteran mental health. There's something that I often say to veterans I work with and something I've said several times on the blog and podcast. Awareness is the key to change. There is so much that we don't know about the complexities of the human mind, heart, and soul. And simply taking the time to develop that awareness can lead to beneficial change. Of course, awareness without an action can't lead to change, but you can't take action unless you first become aware. Hopefully that's what the last two conversations have done for you, giving a deeper understanding about the impact of combat that goes beyond just PTSD and TBI. I don't want to discount those, though. Post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury are very real conditions. They're not the only conditions, though. When we're addressing veteran mental health in a holistic way, we have to acknowledge both those things that we're paying attention to, trauma and the reaction to it, but also those that we don't often think about, which include finding purpose in post-military life, learning how to meet old needs in new ways, family, and moral injury. I appreciate Dr. Tick's time and wisdom that he shared with me and with all of you. Make sure to check out links to all of his books and further discussion about his work on the show notes. Thanks for taking the time to listen. If you want to find the show notes for this episode, go to VeteranMentalHealth.com forward slash HST110. While you're there, consider leaving an honest rating or review. It helps other people find us. We're always looking for guests. You can drop me a line at info at veteranmentalhealth.com to recommend guests, or you can go to veteranmentalhealth.com forward slash guest to fill out a suggestion or request. Just a reminder that the guests and information in this show are for educational purposes only and not meant to be considered professional advice. While I'm a practicing therapist, I'm not your therapist. If something you heard today makes you think that you should talk to somebody, then reach out to do so. I'd like to thank Doc Todd for giving us permission to use his track, Not Alone, from his album, Combat Medicine. Doc's trying to bring the discussion about federal mental health out of the darkness and into the light, and you can see all of his work at therealdoctod.com. Make sure to join us next week for another great episode. Hit subscribe on your podcast player of choice so you don't miss it, and until then, remember, veterans, you're not alone. Ever. The struggle is real, found a piece and lost a soul Eventually my drinking, it got out of control There in darkness I roam, struggling to find home See suddenly death didn't feel so alone 22 a day, destination unknown It could have been avoided if you picked up the phone But now you're gone, so I guess all we get is the tone Nothing but bone weeds, overgrown, pushing up stones I've triumphed over enemies, co-creating enemies Broke out facilities that tried to put an end to me R.I.P., I'd rather grind in tranquility Authentic tendency, embrace my ability
Take those bottles out, dog, and pour them in the sink. Take the needles out your arm and the gun away from your forehead. It's time, man. You've been through enough pain. Stand up. It's time to stand back up. All my veterans, man. Army, Marine Corps, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard. Get up, you know. Get up.